folks, thank you so much for your patience, and welcome to part two of my Boy Meets World review. If you haven't seen part one, then what are you doing? This clearly says part two. Go back and watch part one. You illiterate fuck. Season four finally fully establishes Topanga as as much a part of the cast as Corey, Sean, and Eric. I mean, just look at this opening, the show's cheesiest, where the four of them are riding in the car to goofy music. But this comes at a price, of course, and that price is always the supporting cast. Mr. Turner is MIA for most of the season, and Mr. Williams? Who's he? He just disappeared altogether. Season 4 overall has what are probably considered to be some of the greatest episodes in the entire show. Like, if you look up a list of top 20 greatest Boy Meets World episodes, 8 or 9 of them are probably from the season. Season 4 is one of, if not the most dramatic season of the show. There's little things in the season that hit you where you least expect them. Like the death of the lunch lady. She was in this one single scene in this one single episode, and yet her death is still handled so well that it feels legitimately tragic. Especially the ending where the kids decide to honor her. This happens in the episode Fishing for Verna, which overall just feels like the first fully dramatic episode of the show. It's the episode where Verna returns to Chet, and I kinda hate that she only appears in this season. It's mentioned later that she just took off again. No explanation. I mean, Chet takes off again between seasons too. And I don't like that, because this season is the closest Sean comes to having a normal home life and the show really delivered on the moments I wanted for this character in this season. Sean is the character that the worst things happen to in the show, but you could have let him keep the family that it took him so long to get back. This episode is followed by one of the funniest in the show, Shallow Boy. Yes, this is the one where Eric inspires a musician to write a hate song about him and it becomes a huge hit. This season also has the episode where Corey has to attend a wrestling event to help Frankie bond with his dad, and attend Topanga's Sweet 16, which is awesome. This was an actual match between Vader and Jake the Snake, which means that Ben Savage and Ryder Strong were actually playing these characters ringside at a real event. And of course, the drag episode. This one is another absolute classic. This episode is so hilarious from beginning to end that it's no wonder it's remembered so highly. The dating show episode, also great. I love the quiz show episode, too. It managed to combine a very funny concept with some great lessons and genuinely moving moments. That Nicktoon question had me excited. Ren's the dog, Snippy's the cat, Rocco's a wallaby. And for the bonus points, Honkerburger. And Sean, of all people, actually knowing the answer and throwing the game was awesome. The things this show is willing to talk about start to get even more mature in this season. Like episode 8, which leads you into thinking it's all about sex, and then all of a sudden we're hit with this line. The reason she's been staying at my place, her dad hits her. Yeah, this one was heavy. It really asks what's the right answer in a situation like this. In this season, we also get a little more insight into Feeny's personal life. And this is the season where Feeny and Eric actually become close. It's when Feeny learns from them that always gets me. Also, I know Eric's good looking, but god damn, the MILF bartender who knows he's 18 even wants a piece. Then there's A Long Walk to Pittsburgh, considered by many people to be the greatest episode of the show. What Feeney says to them, I believe that when you find love, you hold on to it and cherish it, because there is nothing finer, and it may never come again. What they say to Corey's parents, And I'm when I'm with her. I feel happy to be alive, like I, like I can do anything, even talk to you like this. So that's, that's what I think is love, Mom, when I'm better because she's here. Also, let's not forget about the biggest breakup in this season, Corey and Sean's breakup. I love that this is the episode where they begin acting like a gay couple, which they continue to do for the rest of the show. This season also contains cult fiction, another grand slam as far as episodes go. Ryder Strong's performance in this episode might possibly be the best dramatic performance in any episode of the show. That monologue and his bedside prayer beside Mr. Turner are two of the most moving moments in a television show that I've ever seen. Okay. All my life, 
I have felt like there was some part of me missing. And, and I felt like everybody could tell. You know, like there was some hole in me and everyone could see through it. Like I wasn't finished or something. But you didn't teach me enough. You and Corey and my parents and the Matthews and the handful of people who really care about me. So don't blow me off, John. Don't blow me off, God. I've never asked you for anything, and I never wanted to come to you like this. But don't take Turner away from me. He's not done yelling at me yet. And after this episode ends, we never see Mr. Turner again. And I hated that. Of all the consistent characters who ever got written out of the show, I think this one was the worst. Mr. Turner was integral to Sean as a character, and could have helped him a lot in the later seasons. He got done dirty. But the character who is the heart of season 4 is Eric. Eric's quest to find who he is reaches its peak in this season. The things we found funny about Eric before come back to haunt him here. His idiocy starts to weigh on him existentially. He tries so hard to find himself in this season, even nearly moving to some town near Allentown before he gets talked out of it. Which, by the way, Feeney's talk with Alan, and in turn, Alan's talk with Eric, are incredible. And the season ends with one of the greatest triumphs in its entire run. Eric not only passes the SATs and gets into college, but he gets into the one he really wanted to go to. I found myself cheering out loud twice for him in this season. Once, when he passes the SATs, and again when he gets into Pembroke. What an absolutely incredible triumph for this character on this show. I'm in. I'm in! I'm in! Also, holy shit, is that Max Keeble? And now, some of the funniest moments from season four. Uh, uh, excuse me, could I have my robe back? Hey, I'm naked under here. <laughs> okay, Karina. Um, I don't know how to say this, so I'm, I'm going to choose my words very carefully. I think you're a psycho. <laughs> I want to get as far away from you as I possibly can. What? Well, I, I'm just not the guy for you. I mean, you need a guy who's, who's happy and perky all the time, you know? Maybe a guy who's had part of his brain removed and he thinks he's a bunny. And you guys can go off and be bunnies together. Check! For the love of God, will someone please for me? Season 5 marks the first appearance of Jack and Angela, two characters who would become the next set of permanent characters through the rest of the show. Jack is Sean's brother and quickly becomes Eric's best friend. There are some great moments of tension between him and Sean as their lives and personalities contrast, but they still attempt to make that brother-brother connection. Then of course, there's Angela. The two-parter, I Love You Donna Karen and Chasing Angela, contains the full initial courtship between Sean and Angela, and these two episodes are awesome. Sean discovering that he loves Angela just from finding the contents of her purse after they already dated briefly, and then winning her over is one of, if not the, greatest triumph that he accomplishes in this show. People seem to really admire Corey and Topanga's relationship, and I'm not trying to diss them. They go through a lot of tough moments. But Sean and Angela's relationship was the one I rooted for the hardest because they didn't have a whole history together or knew each other as kids. They had to work really hard to realize that they loved each other. And that episode where Sean's exes tie him up in the boathouse to prove a point was great. Even Dana is there. You know, the first girl Sean really earned. Guess he dumped her too in the end. Things Change is another great episode. Sean is 100% right about being comfortable working at his job. He's in the right in this situation. That being said, in this season, Corey and Topanga encounter the most massive obstacle to their relationship in the entire show. Lauren, played by Linda Cardellini. Although only in a couple episodes of the show, Lauren becomes a looming figure over the next couple seasons. She's the girl who split up Corey and Topanga. But she also comes to represent this romantic unfamiliarity and otherness that attracts Corey. He's only ever been with Topanga, he wants to test the waters, but then comes to a sudden realization. Sean, yeah. I like Lauren. I like spending time with her. But I can live without her. I, I can't live without Topanga. But by then, it's too late. 
Eric getting into Pembroke was probably his greatest moment on the show, and he does work hard to stay there in this season. But I do love that they kept some of the issues he's had consistent. We really start to see the beginnings of his eccentricness turning into actual insanity. For the love of God, he hallucinates Mr. Feeney in this season. Speaking of Mr. Feeney, I really enjoyed the impossible puzzle he gives Corey, Topanga, and Sean. He prepares them for the biggest test of all, life. And Sean making it to the Super Bowl was the cherry on top. This season also contains the episode, And Then There Was Sean, which is a lot of people's favorite episode. It's the one that's basically a slasher movie. There's a killer hunting them down, Jennifer Love Hewitt is in it, Eric is making early South Park references because I presume South Park had debuted around this time. There's this line. We'll always remember he was that tall. <laughs> but I think perhaps the biggest thing season five does overall is that it's the first season of the show that has storylines that thread through the entire season. The stuff going on in this season no longer feels like it's confined to single episodes. You feel like you have to watch the whole thing to figure it out. Season 5 also has one of the most absolutely hilarious episodes of the entire show. Prom Night. Corey getting a room, that oh shit moment when Eric sees his dad with the other woman, Alan walking in on Topanga, Corey walking in on his mom. It's a hilarious, brilliantly written episode. Oh, and the hotel being the same set as the apartment is just like an added, random thing that made me laugh. Oh, and let's not forget Last Tango in Philly, the one that ends with Corey, Sean, Eric, Jack, Feeney, and Alan all dancing together to disco. You can tell that the cast was just having fun with each other in this scene. And when Corey and Topanga get back together but have to make Sean think that he was the one who got them back together, this was one of those you guys are idiots moments I mentioned before. Ho ho! <laughs> Is that the stupid idea train coming around the bend? There's Eric Hollywood, that wildly surreal one that I talked about earlier. And if you needed any more proof that the surreal stuff is canon, remember the witchcraft episode. Melissa Joan Hart shows up at the end in character as Sabrina, and Salem the Cat is in the following episode. Speaking of that episode, I have to admit, the World War II time travel episode is my least favorite episode in the series. It's not as good as the other two time travel episodes, and if you hadn't seen the episode before it, Salem the Cat's presence would absolutely confuse you. There's also a joke that I thought was going to be made that would have been perfect that they didn't make. The scene where they announced the victory in Europe and Corey celebrating, I thought Sean was going to say, but Corey, we're in the Pacific. That would have been great. What a missed opportunity. I also kind of dislike the Christmas episode in this season. Topanga is high strung and has issues, but she's really, really selfish in this one. Like almost uncharacteristically selfish. And graduation is great. Frankie and Joey are back. Minkus is back. My god, they brought Minkus back. Sure, he's basically used as a punchline, but it's better than nothing. Feeny shows how much he cares about the kids in this episode, and Sean's speech is awesome. I could have done better. That's, um, that's what I wrote. That's how I feel. I'm sorry. I could have done better. Congratulations to those of you who did. It was a fine paper. No one would have done better. And it ends on the biggest most unexpected cliffhanger of all. Will you marry me? Oh, and Alan and Amy are having another kid again. Whatever. Also, Amy's erotic creative writing saga was weird, and Eric is allowed to be disturbed by it. And now, some of the funniest moments from season five. How are you supposed to do well in college if you can't even fill out a housing application? Oh, it's worse than that. Check the wrong box on another form. Now I think I'm an Eskimo. Is so this just you and Topanga? Yes. Alone in the hotel room? Yes. On prom night? Yes. So, what you do? <laughs> on, let me see what's behind that door. Uh, ah! You're moving her into the house? <laughs> I can't do this anymore. I gotta know who's in there. Come out now. Topanga? Oh, Daddy. How could you do this to Mom? And 
and Corey. Oh, I am so out of the loop. Wait, wait. Season six starts by resolving the cliffhanger. His answer is a great episode. This is also the season where Rachel is introduced, the final character who sticks around till the end of the show. This is also the season where Corey and Topanga and Sean all go to college. Yes, even Sean. And I have to admit, I was a little disheartened by that. At the end of season five, he finds a place he's comfortable with in the world, and it would have been nice to see him stick to his guns and not go to college. This was a missed opportunity to explore what life is like for kids who don't go to college after high school, especially ones who have a bunch of friends who did. Not going should have been Sean's decision to make, but instead it feels like the writers decided to make it theirs. After all, everyone else is in college, Sean has to be too, otherwise when are they going to interact and move these storylines forward? But season 6 stands out to me because I legitimately think it has the best overall writing of any season of the show. This season really uses all of its characters, even using ones together that we don't see often. Like the one episode that explores Corey and Angela's friendship. We didn't see them interact much before this. And Eric and Jack have an actual season-long running gag slash conflict for Rachel's affections. Season 6 contains Hogs and Kisses, one of the funniest episodes of the show, which includes the famous food fight. This scene was fucking insane. Parts of it were definitely ad-libbed. Also, I can pinpoint the exact start of Maitland Ward's porn career. Yeah, there it is. Ben Savage's brother Fred also makes a long overdue appearance as Professor Stewart, the slimiest villain in the entire series. Fred Savage is great in this role. I like that Feeney gets a romantic story arc with the Dean, played by William Daniels' real-life wife, Bonnie Bartlett. And Corey and Sean have a throwback episode where they act like scheming idiots to hook them up. I also like that they all stayed awake this time for A Christmas Carol. That's a small way of showing how much they've matured, and I appreciated it. The episode Resurrection is definitely an important one. It tests Corey and Topanga's relationship by proxy. Topanga is usually my least favorite of the main characters, but she grows on me every time she realizes she's wrong. I also love that they brought back the lipstick dance to remind her of who she was and to also handle an issue here. Their relationship is put to the test again at the season's end with Topanga's parents getting divorced, making her question the viability of marriage. And I still cannot get over how Topanga's dad completely changes every time we see him. Like, he used to be a hippie who owned a bookstore and now he's a lawyer? Corey's neuroticism goes overboard in this season. He's also kind of a jerk. I do like that Sean confronts him about it, though. Life continues to hurt Sean in this season. Chet returns, and I kind of hate that he regressed to being an absentee father again. He and Verna were doing all right the last time we saw them. He was home, had a job, etc., and I hate that these changes fell apart off-screen with no explanation. But this did give us a truly incredible episode, in which Sean realizes that his issues that have plagued his relationship with Angela stem from the way his father is. He and Jack get into it, having two completely different perceptions of Chet. And then, of course, Chet dies. This was rough because Sean overcame a lot before entering adulthood, and was then faced with the worst thing imaginable. He's not the kid from the other side of the tracks anymore, but that baggage still hangs over him, and life shitting in his face every chance it gets isn't helping. Of course, Chet's death leads to another major story arc for Eric, who is faced with that heartbreaking moment in which Jack and Rachel kiss. The love triangle that was so funny leading up to this moment is all of a sudden devastating. And this isn't even the worst thing that happens to him in this season. Not by a long shot. After stealing from his family to give to needy kids, Eric meets Tommy and forms a bond with him. And I love that they brought Tommy back multiple episodes in this season. And it's here that Eric experiences his most tragic moment in the entire show. Slowly realizing that he is not able to give Tommy a good life beyond just being a fun older brother, Eric has to tell Tommy that he's not going to adopt him. Tommy. I'm not going to adopt you. I don't like you anymore. I'm sorry to hear that, Tom. And I'm going to California to be with people who care about me. Good for you, Tommy. Good for you, man. Good for you. 
This is the closest this show ever came to breaking me. And I'm convinced that it finally broke Eric because he loses his mind in the final season. I do like that he saw Tommy one more time. I was actually relieved that they provided some closure at the end of the episode. But this was such a hard episode to watch. Will Friedle's absolute versatility in acting is on full display in this season. Oh, and hey, in the painting episode, Morgan is not the same age as this artist. She's clearly way younger, or at least that's what I thought until I found out that the actress who played Morgan actually was older than Alexandra Nikita. Holy shit. This is also the first and only time I've ever seen Banjo-Kazooie mentioned in a sitcom, which is awesome. Also, this was the closest we ever got in the entire series to a Morgan-centered episode, and I fucking hate that Corey ruined her big moment the way he did. Like I said, he's a jerk. And then season six ends with everyone in limbo. It's kind of a haunting ending. Things are in limbo with Corey and Topanga, with Sean and Angela, and with Eric in general. And I think that's what makes season six so special. Season six of Boy Meets World was very special for me because although season five was the first season to have running storylines, season six felt like the first one that told the complete story. This was the season where I could not wait to find out what happened next. This was the closest Boy Meets World came to keeping me on the edge of my seat. And for that, it is extremely special. And now, some of the funniest moments from season six. You know what the best part about being a virgin is? What? No, I'm asking. But why are you so obsessed with sex? Because I don't get any. Let, let's stop right there, okay? You don't have a mediocre life. <sighs> There's nothing about me that separates me from anybody else. Mine is Shinene Martin Luther King Boulevard. <laughs> Gosh, I gotta get some black friends. <laughs> the problem is Jack. I mean, ever since Rachel moved in, we've had this unspoken competition between the two of us. Uh, sometimes, at night, I imagine he gets killed. Okay. <laughs> Angel's in the same place you are. <laughs> so it says, Feeney, if the sun never sets in the British Empire, when do they watch Letterman? <laughs> On the first day, we start off with... <laughs> and then we focus on... <laughs> The final season of Boy Meets World has a lot going on, so bear with me. I'm gonna talk first about Cory and Topanga. It's a little weird that Topanga broke up with Cory instead of just waiting a little longer to get married. It's also weird that Cory could not wrap his head around the concept of divorce. Also, in that one episode where it's revealed that Cory has hypochondria and everyone just brushes him off, Hypochondria is real, and Corey asking for a little empathy from his friends and his wife shouldn't have been too much. But then comes the moment, the moment we've all been waiting for, Corey and Topanga getting married. First, they have to plan the wedding in hilarious fashion. Then they bring back the Jewish guy from season one as a priest. There's an amazing Sean and Corey moment, Sean's speech is great, and Eric's plan to get the wedding at the hotel was amazing. And obviously, the reveal that the hotel manager is also Will Friedel was insane and fucking hilarious. And Eric's plan actually had consequences this time. I do love that Corey not losing his virginity has become a running joke of the show, and less and less believable over time. But it was worth it for this little bit from the honeymoon. You still sleeping? Oh yeah. I wore him out. God damn, Topanga! Maybe it was worth the wait. I don't like the way Corey's parents don't help them when they need a place to live. Now, I know everyone has different parents with different parenting styles and home situations, but I don't think most people's parents would ever let their kids move into a shithole apartment like that instead of letting them stay with them until they get back on their feet if they could afford to. You are not drowning. Well, what do you call living in an awful dorm with no money and the washing machine's broken in the laundry room and there's some kind of soup coming out of the faucet? Marriage, I call it marriage. Okay, well no, it's not. It doesn't have to be. The whole we didn't have any help mindset is bullshit. If you have the means to help your kids so they aren't forced to live in a fucking crack house, you fucking do it. That's what being a parent is. But I do like that Sean knows how to make the best of it because he came from a place like that. 
One of the highlights of Season 7 is Sean and Angela getting back together. I only want good things for Sean, and believe me, this is the last truly good thing that happens to him. Then, of course, his family shit keeps sending him back home, relapsing, wondering who he really is. But Sean admitting that his father did something right and that he loves and is proud of him is perhaps the most satisfying ending to any personal story arc on the show. But then, it happens. Sean's final heartbreak in a life full of them. The show shits in Sean's face one last time. The writers took a lot of people from Sean, but I didn't want Angela to be one of them. But in the end, he has to let her go because he, of all people, understands what it's like to not have your parents around. And this is where their story ends in Boy Meets World. It's not clear whether or not they break up before she leaves for Europe. She mentions that she'll write him, and that's what we're left with. I fucking hated this for Sean. He went through the ringer this entire show, and Angela would have been the one thing he had to show for it. And then the writers took her from him right before the end. This is the season where Eric finally fully unravels, but I like that Eric is still Eric. Like, as crazy as he gets, he's still the same fun-loving idiot we know and love, and he's not done growing yet. The one episode where he plots revenge against Topanga for beating him in that wrestling match where they won the room from the boys is absolutely hilarious. The blooper reel at the end is even great. I usually hate bloopers in movies and stuff, but it doesn't feel out of place in a show that has already admitted that its characters are just characters multiple times. It was nice just seeing them laugh and be themselves. The War and Seven the Hard Way are in this season, and are often considered two of the best episodes of the show. The episode manages to be both hilarious and meaningful, which is the hallmark of a great Boy Meets World episode. Although Feeny does seem a little out of character with his enjoyment of the pranks. The car and the bear are hilarious, though. It is funny that Rachel was more offended by the picture of her than they were of almost getting killed by a bear. It's also funny to think that Maitland Ward would be offended by a naked picture of herself in general. And of course, the episode contains one of the best lines in the series. Lose one friend, lose all friends. Lose yourself. Of course, there's the episode where Topanga thinks she's getting fat and everyone else thinks she's getting pregnant. The Garage Sale episode was great as sort of a final statement on the brotherhood between Corey and Eric. They started growing apart again the same way they did at the end of Season 3, but this time, the ball was in Corey's court. There's some other fun random stuff in this season. Mankind is here with Mr. Sako, and he gives Jack the mandible claw. That's cool. Would have been a little cooler if they brought back Vader too, though. And they mentioned Celebrity Deathmatch. Holy shit, talk about a blast from the past. Corey and Topanga talking to the audience about the online RSVP to their wedding was pretty cool. Definitely a product of its time. And the sanitation department there is probably on strike. This, this right here, is the closest the show ever comes to accurately representing Philadelphia. And really, you guys already did a drag episode. I love that Sean gives Eric advice, though, because he did it before. Okay, now let's talk about the final episode. It's intercut with clips from previous seasons, which is a nice throwback. It's been forever since Eric called next door for Feeny. They bring back the plant analogy. I like that Sean and Jack and even Chet had a great resolution to their story. Corey gives Joshua the Boy Meets World speech, which honestly is probably the greatest monologue in the show. You know what's out there? The world. You're going to be part of it someday. You're going to learn something from it every day. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make good friends. Mr. Feeney will probably teach you every grade you're ever in. <laughs> but when you're not a little boy anymore, when the world taught you how to be this man, you know you're still going to make mistakes. But your family and your friends that you've made along the way are going to help you, okay? Even though it'll seem like the world's going out of its way to teach you these hard lessons, you're going to realize that, you know, it's the same world that's given you your family and your friends, you know? And you're going to come to believe that the world's going to protect you too. Boy meets world. Now I get it. Then, of course, their goodbye to Feeny. An incredible emotional moment. This final farewell was an immensely powerful finale to an amazing show. And all I could think after it was over was man. I'm really gonna miss these guys. And now for some of the funniest moments from season seven. I can't spend another second in this place. Why not? Because the cute one's looking at me. <laughs> you think Howie's a cute one? 
I thought Nick was the cute one. Oh, let's get the hell out of here. You are a disgrace to this university, to this country, and humanity in general. Wow. <laughs> Drop and give me 20. Fine. Dude, you better pay me back. <laughs> no, Eric, I... I Eric, I, you're getting up for the camera! <laughs> My brother is a moron, which nobody can deny. <laughs> no, no, one oh, quick, just real quick, just real quick. Oh. I just have one question for Rocco. Hey, Rocco, just curiously, um, as an athlete on the football team, uh, is it a distraction being gay? Oh! <laughs> Thank you. Okay. What? I've been holding it in for so long. <laughs> Fellas, I'm gay. That's okay, Rocco, so are we. Really? <laughs> oh, sure. Okay, we were very careful. Did you use a... Yes! Was she on the... Uh-huh. Well, did you try the... Everything! <laughs> Not even sure we had sex. Is this a bad time? I had a feeling that if it wasn't yet, it was gonna be. Gonna be what? What? Well, I just heard you say. No, I didn't. But I heard you. She was as stubborn as a mule with twice the kick. You did it again. Did what? Maybe this was a mistake. What? I didn't say anything. Yes, you did. I think an enormous theme in Boy Meets World that flies under a lot of people's radar is the concept of finding your place in the world. This is one thing that unites just about every character on the show. Corey is afraid of being viewed as mediocre and boring, often taking risks to compensate for how he thinks he's viewed. Sean tries to avoid getting sucked into a future that he thinks is unavoidable for him, and later tries out running a past that keeps surprising him in tragic ways. Eric struggles with settling for less than he's capable of, often falling back on not believing in himself when the going gets tough. And it's interesting to point out that by the end, these aren't things that these characters have completely overcome. They're issues that they work through the entire series, and the viewer would assume they continue to work through them throughout their lives. I did say earlier that it's easy to grow attached to characters on the show who then disappear after appearing on a season or two, but there is one character who was around for the entire series run that I really, really think they dropped the ball with. And that character is Morgan. The actors who played her may have changed. There was that long stretch in season three where she disappeared, but Morgan is in every single season of Boy Meets World. And she's never once the focal point of an episode. There are times when she comes close but it's always used as a way to move someone else's plot along. She's a member of the Matthews household and a lingering presence on the show, yet she never gets her moment. I think that's a contributing factor to why she's arguably the least popular character on the show. Speaking of characters, I think I'd like to spend a little more time on some of the main ones. My two favorite characters on the show are, surprise surprise, Eric and Sean and I'm willing to bet that they are everyone's two favorites. This is because they are the most developed and consistent characters on the show. But if I had to choose between the two, I think my personal favorite is Eric. You can't help but fall in love with a character who is absolutely the funniest character on the show, but also the most complex. That's just a winning combo. People often point out that Eric Matthews starts out somewhat normal and just loses his mind in the final season. And... This is not true. Eric is always a little off the entire series, starting from the first season. What the show does magnificently is show him slowly get crazier over time. Yes, the thing with Tommy definitely pushed him over the edge to where his sanity breaks almost completely, but his mental stability is shown degrading gradually before that the entire show. It's played for laughs most of the time, and it is hilarious, but it's still there, and I still noticed it. And the fact that this character still made 
huge accomplishments and is still overall a good person who tries his best, despite being insane, lazy, and a little dumb, is part of the reason that I found myself cheering for him so much when he did the right thing. Whether that led to a triumphant moment or a devastating one. All of these characters are trying to find their place in the world, but Eric is the one who we see trying to find it most desperately. So those times when he does, fill me with immense satisfaction. I love this guy. So now we gotta talk about my second favorite character, Sean Hunter. Sean is the character who the most bad things happen to in the series, and is indeed the character through whom the show explores bad home lives and insecurities. Whereas Eric has a mental handicap, Sean has a social one. Sean is a troubled kid who comes from a broken home, and his conflict throughout the show is feeling like he can't move beyond that. There are many times when he does move beyond it, only for it to come back to haunt him. In seasons 2 and 3, he's kinda homeless. In season 4, he reaches a new plateau where his family actually acts like a family, but then things fall apart off-screen after, and in season 6 and 7, though he's more well-adjusted, this past tends to come back and devastate him when he least expects it. What's worse, his insecurities harm his relationship with Angela, a relationship that he had to fight for. I've said it before, this is my favorite relationship in the series because, although Cory and Topanga do go through the ringer together and earn each other, and I'd never take that from them, they've always had each other. Sean and Angela have had to find each other, lose each other, find each other again, and lose each other again. And I do fucking hate that their relationship is left in limbo. This was absolutely the least satisfying ending any story arc got on this show. Even worse than Mr. Turner's exit, or lack thereof. But aside from that final heartbreak, seeing Sean overcome everything else that the writers threw at him. His home life, not having a home, criminal influence, his playboy reputations, his issues with love, the death of his father, finding out that his mother wasn't really his mother, and finally, becoming a positive influence on his older brother, who he thought he had nothing in common with. Sean Hunter is a hero to many, and he should be. I will admit there are times when Cory and Topanga got on my nerves, especially Topanga, but I still enjoyed these characters, and I do think they deserve each other. I mean, come on, they're such type A personalities. I don't think anyone else would put up with either of their bullshit for long. For a lot of people who grew up with the show, their relationship was a gold standard of what a relationship should look like. Mistakes and all. And I gotta admit, Corey's willingness to work out any problem is admirable. I do wish the writers would have just made him a little less neurotic and persistent as the show went on. And I do wish that they would have made Topanga just a little less of a nagging killjoy as the show went on. But it's in the moments when they show each other and others that they care about them that their true nature really shines through. Which brings us to the character who serves as the guiding force in this story of a boy meeting the world. Mr. George Feeney. Perhaps the greatest teacher in the history of television, and an even better life coach and advice giver. Mr. Feeney is the closest a person in this show comes to introducing the other characters to the world. He has the most poignant lines in the series, and I don't think a single one of them falls flat. But despite being written with such sage wisdom, Feeney is still written like a human being. Bits about his past are revealed over time, like his childhood, his late wife, the woman he meets once a year to talk into moving to Philly to live with him. We see him go through a career change and marry someone. We see him involved in the other characters' misadventures. But most importantly, we see him learn from them too. Learning is a two-way street, and he learns from those he teaches. Mr. Feeney is proof that you never stop learning. Okay. We're almost done. So now that we're in the home stretch of this insanely long video, is there anything I have left to say about Boy Meets World that I haven't already said? Probably not. What in the hell am I going to reiterate at this point? This show could be hilarious and poignant in the same breath. It had characters we fell in love with who were written as if they were flesh and blood, and made us care about them even after it was revealed that they weren't flesh and blood. Funny. Tragic. Hard-hitting. Goofy. Surreal. Impactful. Perfect? Well, no. Nothing's perfect. But Boy Meets World is good TV. And even though I've said before that shows like this aren't meant to be marathoned, I feel like I could do it again someday. 
Revisit the rich history of these characters whose lives so often resembled our own. It's been said before by people who've worked on Boy Meets World that, although it had high ratings, it was not seen as the hallmark of TGIF at the time of its original airing. During its original run, people seemed to be more fond of Full House and Family Matters. However, in recent years, Boy Meets World has grown to be considered by many to be the greatest show in the history of the programming block. Boy Meets World was a sitcom that was lucky enough to have the run that it did and ended at the appropriate time. Because these characters weren't kids anymore. And that's pretty special. Most shows don't go out like that. It didn't get cancelled. It had great ratings. But the people behind it knew it was just time. It had its time. And it made its point. So, to end this video, I'd like to read a quote from The Adventures of Tom Sawyer that I feel is appropriate to put here. So endeth this chronicle. It strictly being a history of a boy, it must stop here. The story could not go much further without becoming the history of a man. And if you made it this far, I'd just like to say one last thing to all of you. I love you all. Class dismissed. Thanks for listening. Uh, Alright, I think I've earned a break. Maitland's meeting me in my trailer in 15 minutes, and I- Hey, plebe! Joe, now's not a good time. But you forgot something! Fuck. Guys, thanks so much for watching this video. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you like this channel, hit the subscribe button. If you want to see more videos like this, tell your friends, join the Patreon, hit me up, you know where I'll be. Thanks for watching and stay tuned.